Hello, everyone, and welcome to Channel 781 News. Uh, today, we wanted to dive a little deeper on a topic that we've discussed in our recent debrief episode. Um, the Sober House application on Robin Street has been going through the motions of the Waltham City Council, and it's been um, a pretty contentious issue, both from the public and from the um, from the Waltham uh, City Council perspective, uh, we thought it deserved a more thorough looking into, so uh, that's why we're here today. Um, we have a new face to Channel 71 News joining us, uh, so thank you, Kara. Hello, Kara. Hello. Thank you for yeah. having me on. I'm a you know long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> well, thank you for being a long time uh, fan of Channel 71 News, um, and also we have James as well. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being a very consistent partner in Channel 71 News. Um, so yeah, uh, Kara, um, so maybe a little background on yourself about why you're interested in this and then just, uh, you know, what do you got? So pretty straightforward. I work, uh, I'm a nurse by training. I worked in, uh, I'm actually trained as like a, a medical nurse, but I've worked in a psychiatric hospital for the last five years. And I'm currently, I work with patients um, in detox and just various stages of their uh, different mental illnesses. So that's why this this um, issue, when I saw it come up on city council, I'm like, ooh, I'm, I'm interested in this and I wanna see how, uh, how this is being done. What inspired you to come to the show today? Yeah, so I was right. I was watching um, I was watching this happening on um, in real time at the first meeting on uh, May twenty second when they had the gentleman uh, Jeff Gershom from uh, Mass Sober Housing Alliance um, come on. I think it's really important to put this issue into context. Sober living homes aren't aren't things that most everyday lay people are um, familiar with. They're actually kind of a newer concept. Um, we all know that Massachusetts has been kind of the epi epicenter of this opioid use disorder pandemic um, after 2020. Uh, a lot of people who had pre-existing pre mental illness or just inadequate social support um, either returned to using or started using alcohol and other drugs. Um, this also happened when we had a amassing housing crisis. So just a lot of these issues converging caused a lot of diseases of despair. Um, and I tell people if, if lockdown was tough for you, then it was impossible for these folks. Um, so then what is sober housing? Sober housing essentially provides an opportunity for adults who finish detox, which is a very short time limited, like five, six day medical stay, which you're um, essentially weaned from the substances. Um, they finish that and they've usually finished um, a longer type of program which focuses on addiction and recovery. Um, and they just need a place to stay for a short amount of time um, that's substance free. Um, there's really strict rules to get into these sober houses. You have to apply. It's not insurance based. You know, you pay your own way. There's typically scholarships. Um, and really there's zero tolerance policies for alcohol. I, I see a lot of patients who've been um, you know, I, I see them on the other side when they come into the, the detox and it's generally they've come from, a, um, you know, one strike policy at these sober homes. They had one slip up and they they kind of the community comes together and supports this person and gets them into detox. Um, so I um, I felt it was important to explain a little bit more about the the nuances of how this type of service works um, within the state, because there's just a lot of um, it can lead to a lot of misunderstanding. I've been following, like I said, I followed the issue this whole time. I was really impressed um, on May 22nd when they had the city council meeting to, um, it was a uh, public input hearing um, because this, the gentleman, Jeff Gershom, who wants to open it, is going to run it, um, apply for a uh, lodging license for this sober home, a men's only sober home. Um, he doesn't have to apply for a lodging license. Um, why is he applying for a lodging license? Well, that that allows the city, once it's approved, to come in quarterly for the first two years to inspect the building. Um, this is an example of this gentleman kind of going above and beyond. Um, when I was watching the city council meeting at home, again, with like my background in this field, I was really impressed by this guy. Um, he's a CEO of a local medical practice that takes care of Walthamites right around the corner in Watertown, Square Medical. This is going to be the most legitimate by the book sober house the city will ever see. Um, and I was just impressed. Um, 
So we there was a public meeting. There was a handful of Ward 8 constituents who came in um, to oppose the lodging license. You know, the things that people would typically say who aren't educated about these. Um, they're worried about violent crime. They're worried about public drunkenness. Um, and they don't think it should be allowed in a residential zone. Um, sober homes are residences. People people live there. So um, that's that argument's kind of thrown out in the trash. Um, there's a, they're going to have a... Um, lights out at 9, 8, 9 p.m. So every resident has to be like in the room kind of preparing to go to bed. Um, so I think actually these would, these would be the best neighbors you could ever ask for. Um, it looks like James James had a question. I don't know, it's, it's also interesting that they're complaining about this thing having like, you know, like a raucous atmosphere, but like it's right around the corner from like shoppers and like other bars and stuff on Moody Street. Like I'm from there's nowhere this is. So it's not like it's like uh they say it's a residential neighborhood, but like this is right by the main drag. Yeah, that so that's that's an interesting issue and that got brought up. So I'm not gonna include I have some clips from both of the meetings, the initial public input hearing at the city council meeting and then the um the meeting at license and franchise, because this is a license, so that's the proper community to discuss this. Um I'm not not gonna include clips of the neighbors, they kind of made those points, it's going to be loud, blah, blah, blah. Um, I will mention one argument that ties into what James was saying. Um, the neighbor said that having a sober house located within walking distance of restaurants, bars, and liquor stores, which is really any downtown in this in this country, is inappropriate. Um, so let's let's go back to square one. What's the purpose of the sober housing? To reintegrate people who are formerly addicted to alcohol and other drugs into society. Much of society in America revolves around serving and using alcohol. It's all going away. We tried to get rid of it, and nobody liked that. Um, I brought this up to highlight kind of the futility of trying to argue that a bustling downtown is a bad location for people getting back on their feet to seek employment and other opportunities. Uh, Gershom himself bring this up, and um, he's being questioned by Mayor McLaughlin. Um, about his the sober house he operates in Quincy, which also has um, a lodging license. Um, so let's run that clip um, about uh, the location, why it's an appropriate location. I just want to actually, that brings me to, go, uh, if I could take a, a minute to explain why this is a, a good location and not a bad location. So what we try to avoid is being in uh, single family cul-de-sacs where there's no access to transportation, there's no access to jobs, there's no access to churches, a groups, any kind of uh, any kind of supportive structures. Moody Street is actually a perfect place uh, for this. For, uh, and, and again, we're right on the border of a commercial district. This is where they can get, if you don't have a, a, a license, you can get on a bus, you can walk to a job, you can walk to an A group down the street at, at the church. Um, I don't think that this is a, a typical um, residential, um, you know, what you would think of as like a single family cul-de-sac neighborhood. Um, I think there's a rooming, there is a rooming house across the street that uh, rents beds by the week. Um, this house used to be a rooming house, um, uh, although it wasn't licensed as such, but the previous owner ran it that way. And it had eight single, single beds and two um, uh, single family, uh, single bedroom apartments and only had two parking spots. At minimum, we're improving that. And I think this is, so I would just like to challenge that this isn't a good spot. This is a, this is about as good of a spot for a sober home as you can find. Sorry. Okay. All right. Um, and then next, um, so, so next, Kathy Ann Harris, um, Ward 8 counselor, had her um, had her chance to question this individual, Gershom, um, because this uh, sober house is going to be in her ward. She first, right off the bat, she requested additional steps um, to be taken before the license got considered. She wanted more butters to be contacted. She wanted additional parking studies completed before they even looked at this license. Um, she also requested numbers of the names. She requested the names and numbers of any managers that would be like on site at the building because there's typically um, a manager there 24 seven and, and shifts. Um, kind of weird. I don't, they're not even hired yet. So that's going to be challenging. Um, you mentioned this is a lodging house. So this is, sounds good already be part of that whole oversight anyways, that they'd have that contact information. Exactly, exactly. So that's part of, that's part, like already kind of happening. She's just kind of asking these questions. Um, and he, he answers them very succinctly. Um, she then wanted to know if the sober house would prioritize people from Waltham. She says, 
you know, are, are you guys, you guys are in Waltham, you want to be part of the community, or how are you going to prioritize people from Waltham? Um, so I have a few clips. She, after that, she gets caught kind of looking a little silly because um, she, she made a statement saying that these people were in treatment and that they're like in the, the stages of the recovery process. And it's actually, no, they're not, they're not in treatment. This is just a place for people to live without substances. And, um, and she gets kind of put in a place by Gershom, which was amusing to see. Um, one in your plan about offering, um, cause another, you know, resident also spoke in offering this service to the city of Waltham, um, are you giving any sort of preference to Waltham residents that are in need of, of treatment? Yeah, that's something that we, um, we, we discussed in the uh, reasonable accommodation. We will try to work with local um, uh, organizations uh, that, uh, you know, local police department, uh, churches, AA groups, um, local medical practices that would naturally be our first kind of referral uh, uh, list, but um, we certainly wouldn't just take people from Waltham um, because there's a lot of neighboring towns, but um, just through organic referrals, I, I believe that Waltham has a deficiency of sober housing. Um, so I would imagine most people would come from the immediate so area. I would want to be more direct about that. So um, I think what I'm asking is slightly different. It's not a concept. It's if we're gonna put a sober house in Waltham, and we're not gonna first give first refusal to Waltham residents in need, then perhaps we need to rethink that because the whole idea of being in Waltham is to be a part of the community and help the community in that way. So I, if you're not able to answer that here, I would want that in writing for committee and also submit it to the clerk so that we can discuss it. Um, I don't think, I, I, I understand what you're saying, but there's no mechanism um, that exists. And um, I'm, I, I sit on the board of sober housing for the state of uh, for, uh, Massachusetts. There's no mechanism in place for a first right of refusal. There'd be no mechanism to keep a bed unfilled waiting for a Waltham yeah, resident. I'm not, excuse me, Madam President, I'm not, I'm not saying that. I think, okay. we're, I think we're lined up slightly differently here okay. let me recast um, kind of just take a breath there what I'm asking you is if there was a bed that was open yes you don't hold it for a Waltham resident right. you have an intake of a Waltham resident and you give that first to the Waltham resident like so if you had three people who were who were uh, in queue so to speak to get uh, an opportunity here that that would go to the Waltham resident given that it's in Waltham because that helps keep families together and it helps bring the community together and it helps us address, you know, our own challenges in our community. That's what I'm asking you, sir. Okay. Boom. Would you consider uh, that? I, I'd have to check with my counsel on that. I, I'm I not, agree. I'm, I I'm not sure that I can, but I'll check. I would really appreciate yeah, that. Absolutely. On behalf of the residents of Waltham and the residents of Ward 8, I think that's really, really important. So when you talk about your other location, one of the things that was raised by the residents is that we're in, we're in, we're um, bringing people into treatment who are in various stages of recovering from their addiction. And uh, can you just talk about that? Because um, you are gonna be very proximal to a liquor store. There are several, <coughs> Uh, restaurants and you know, um, you know, if yeah. people are in treatment, you know, talk about why. Just, just to educate here um, a little bit, please. So, just uh, taking a step back and and and, yeah. and explaining some of my, um, uh, you know, uh, this is my profession uh, as work. I I'm, I'm the, also the CEO of uh, Square Medical Group, which treats a lot of Waltham residents for mental health. Uh, we're a community mental health center okay. uh, and a licensed substance abuse uh, outpatient center. We, uh, I also sit and chaired the board of uh, MASH, which is the Mass Alliance for Sober Housing yeah. uh, for three years. And I continue to sit on the board. So a lot of the policies that are statewide, I'm very familiar with in, in how uh, sober homes uh, interact with the rest of the uh, treatment and recovery infrastructure of the state. Yeah. Um, sober housing is the last step in, in uh, recovery uh, for most individuals. It is not treatment. Uh, there's actually no clinical uh, services that are legally allowed to be provided in a sober home. It is strictly a sober environment uh, that is not paid by. Ultimately, Wardy Councilor Harris um, played her favorite trick in the book, which is requesting a neighborhood input meeting to 
in her words, unpack the conversation as a community. So um, just to keep everyone on the timeline, on 522, the city council meeting, um, where there was public input about the um, the license, and Councilor Harris made some requests, the city council made plenty of requests of this gentleman. And then um, two weeks later, last week, License and Franchises Committee met to discuss this issue in its committee. Um, by this time, Gershom had, had provided all the documents, um, and actually an attorney from Jeanette McCarthy's law department um, was it was present so she could discuss kind of what's been happening. Um, important to note is that this application process process started 10 months ago. This has been going on for 10 months. Um, and um, like I said, the attorney came in and talked about the agreement that they're working on. It's called the Reasonable Accommodations Agreement. So let's roll that clip um, up from our city's law department about how this process has been um, unrolling over the past 10 last months. Week, but I could certainly address what has happened through the law department to bring us to this point, if that would sort of shed some light on, on how we got where we are right now. Um, the, the building department received this application um, for the sober house and, uh, and a request for reasonable accommodation, at which point the, they contacted the law department and, and to, collectively the building department um, and myself met with these gentlemen um, to discuss their proposal and, and look at the, the law surrounding sober houses and the Federal Fair Housing Act and what was required of the city with respect to, um, to, to what is known as a reasonable accommodation. And as I'm sure you heard last week, um, sober houses such as this have some level of federal protection um, against discrimination because this is um, addiction is considered a, a disability. So um, the city does have some, oblig some legal obligation to accommodate special requests um, to allow these types of facilities outside our strict zoning parameters within reason. And the way that um, many communities deal with this is through what is known as a reasonable accommodation agreement. So um, through our meetings with this entity and um, review of, of their other properties and review of, of what has been done in other communities, we developed a draft reasonable accommodation agreement, which was a you know give and take back and forth between the law department, the building department, and this entity. Um, and through part of that negotiation, what we determined was that a, a lodging house license would be a reasonable way to have some ongoing oversight of this use. Um, it would be an opportunity for the city council to um, to look at this use and and make the determination to apply the federal fair housing waive the zoning for this particular district and allow the house to, to operate um, in an area where lodging houses would not normally be allowed, um, but it would also allow for uh, incorporation of some of these these agreed upon standards. Um, so this applicant agreed to um, apply. Um, what you saw there, um, the city is legally obligated to provide this license within a reasonable time frame. Um, they, if they don't do this, they're actually violating federal law and they're violating a state law. Um, and, and it seems to be they're just waiting on this hearing. So I have a few clips that I want to run about um, the lawyer uh, mentioning the, the clock or the timeline. And then we also have uh, McLaughlin and a few of the other in Vidal kind of going back with Gershom, who wants to open this, the sober house um, about the timeline. And um, let's roll those. <laughs> There is not a, a clock as you have in the zoning context on these license applications, right. but um, this applicant has gone through a fairly lengthy process up to this point to, to get to where we are. Um, and certainly, you know, we have to be reasonable about the amount of time that it takes to, um, to see this through through to the end. And my question so, has more to do with the scheduling of a neighborhood meeting and, and with the Ward 8 Council and need to get that done by a certain date. What you're actually saying is, it's not. We can't delay this. Uh, we want to move uh, forward with um, taking a vote on this. I would say after the neighborhood meeting and after we get a chance to review what they submitted tonight. Okay. In in, in doing this uh, reasonable accommodation, um, you know, we've developed a building plan and 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 certain things that we've gone through that have taken months and months and months. 
So as part of this uh, a neighborhood meeting, I'm, I've done neighborhood meetings in the past. I'm fine doing a neighborhood meeting. What I'm concerned about and what language I'm, I'm starting to get a little concerned about is they're going to have, the neighbors are going to uh, give us input into what we're going to, you know, how we're going to make modifications. And so that might reset the whole clock for what if they say move the staircase and then, then we go back to building and then, and then it becomes a discriminatory timeline, right? So I just want to kind of point that out that, you know, I'm fine having a neighborhood meeting as long as it's reasonable in that we're not going to go back to square one. Thank you very much. Councilor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, just through you to the petitioner. So with, with some processes, we have a 90 day clock. And in that process for that type of special <clears throat> permit, we have to request the petitioner to, to give us an extension. That's really where I was coming from. And in some, um, some type of telecommunications uh, matters, we have a shot clock we have to work with. That's where the Ward 3 um, uh, Council's question came from. That was where I was coming from. Uh, it's not a... Um, so what would be a timeline here? Because I, I don't understand, you know, we have a neighborhood meeting, then they make recommendations, then what is the, what is the timeline? Oh, I'll, I'll, I don't think... Can't be again, again, there is no... We don't have a timeline on, the, on a license on this sort of license. No, I can speak to that. So, it, it's not a it's not a delay tactic. It's more about um, having the neighborhood meeting, getting that scheduled. Once that's over, coming back to this committee. This committee meets once every two two weeks, um, and that's that's kind of the timeline you're looking at. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm here to make any assumptions. Uh, I'm here to roll the clips and let people see for themselves what what might be happening with this project and to add that little bit of background information about kind of what what role these um, these services play in our community. It's a great role. Um, so yeah, the, if the city if the city wanted to do a public hearing, uh, they should have did it nine months ago, eight yeah. months ago. Um, and so I'm curious. If if someone were to ask Kathy Ann how long she's known about this, uh, how long you know what she would say, honestly or not, um, and I mean it's very much Kathy's mo to try and do a public public hearing, um, especially when people are angry. I wouldn't say. I mean I don't really know what the truth is about how strongly she feels about the subject because there's precedent for Kathy Ann doing what a city councilor should do, which is listening to her constituents and then doing a public hearing. Um, for the thing that people care a lot about. And so I'm not, you know, it's hard to say whether Kathy Ann approve, uh, supports this or does not. What I can say is that the neighborhood, what I can say, I shouldn't say neighborhood at all because it was a vast majority of the neighbors did not come to that uh, meeting. Uh, a very vocal- it's four, yeah, right? It's yeah, four, four people, yeah. Yeah, and one lady people. spoke like three yeah. times. It's yeah. like, okay, yeah. we, we got it. You don't like so it. So it's tough to say, it's tough to say, how many people support it? If Kathy Ann supports it, what I can say is those four people did not like it, and so Kathy Ann is going to do her job, and she's going to she's going to put on this public hearing. Does she realize that it's completely nonsensical, and you know it's just people venting, and they're going to approve it anyway? Um, probably. I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess yes. Uh, yeah, that's a city tactic. They yeah. they you know <laughs> the the decision's kind of already been made, but they entertain you know they they and, have this as kind of a and I don't know. My hope is, you know, I really would like to think that they're going to go to that neighborhood meeting. Kathy Ann is going to bring up all the things that have went on at that license and franchise meeting, bring the document of all of the things that uh, John brought to committee, which was all, all of the points that needed to be brought up. He brought a nice packet of them. I hope people hear all that stuff and it squashes all of their concerns because there's really nothing wrong with having this kind of sober house in a neighborhood. It's not, it's not going to be disruptive. It's just people living their lives and mm -hmm. the neighborhood will be fine with it. And um, an interesting, an interesting part about the license and franchise meeting that John, John McLaughlin, he's a, he's a man. He just kind of throws things out there that you weren't expecting. He, he opened the meeting with Gershom. Now this is the gentleman that wants to open the, the sober house, the CEO of mess sober housing Alliance. He said, there was a Boston Globe article about sober houses and many of my constituents were concerned because the gentleman in it looked just like you. And um, I'm on the social media beat. I'm 
I read everything I see that about about this this issue. I, I didn't see any article in the Boston Globe. I, I, I it was just it was bizarre. And um, he was it, Gershom was like, yeah, there's there's bad actors. This guy doesn't run certified homes. This is why the certification is important. And it wasn't me. It was it was just a bizarre thing to to kind of spend your time. On. Yeah, Especially was, when these things go for so long, like why, why? And yeah, definitely. so it's tabled on the floor of the licensed franchise meeting right now. Um, they're going to wait for this public hearing, um, despite you know it doesn't really matter because not, they can't change. It would they would they can't restart this process. Um, I mean, they they could. No, sure, they, they, they could try. They'd certainly, be facing um, yeah. legal repercussions, which yeah. sometimes yeah. that's what takes the city to do things. Sadly, mm -hmm. I'm learning. Yeah, getting threatened to be sued. Yep. So I'm glad to be. Yeah, able to... and I'm actually going to email Kathy in right now and be like, "Oh, when's your public input hearing for the sober house? I don't see a date." Yeah, I'm, an I'm, abundant, I'm a neighbor. I'm a, a, I'm a neighbor, neighbor, and I hate this thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I should. I should be like, I'm worried about public drunkenness. Quick word. All right. Okay, thank you very much. We'll see you all at our next upload. Bye. Bye, right, bye, everyone.